Hello and welcome to Unprofessional Engineering. My name is James. You got Luke. Luke, we're talking about one of the biggest projects of all time this episode. The Big Dig? The Big Dig. No, the Manhattan Project. Oh. Listener right in. That was whenever they decided to build Manhattan right beside New York on the island. Should have never done that. It was a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Not that Manhattan Project? No, not that one. That was another one. But this one is actually, fun fact, see if you knew this. It was a U.S. and British project, and a dash of Canadian. Yeah, I heard the I heard the uh, the Great White North was involved a little bit I, too. I thought it was just America, you know, because that's what we always think here in America. Yeah. But yeah, even Canada got involved a little bit. But we kind of were the ones like in I mean, charge yeah. and doing everything. What else is new? Did you also see that Roosevelt and Churchill got together and they agreed, like, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't tell Russia about this. I think I thought Winston Churchill was a U.S. president for a while. Did you really? I don't know. The name sounds very American. Winston <laughs> Churchill. <laughs> oh, that hurts, Luke. It does. That really well, hurts. No, I, I knew that, but I don't know. Anyways, we kept this a secret from Russia, which I guess it was, was it Russia? I guess it was a Soviet Union at that time. USSR, USSR. was to be exact, because uh, if we did the whole cold, that basically, whenever we did what we did, which we'll talk about later, that basically ignited the Cold War. Okay. We, we ended World War II, but we ignited the Cold War, which was 50 years of, don't blow me up. Wow. Sorry. That was well done. Uh, the Soviets actually did know about it, though, because they had a spy. Even though we were homies, they were spying on us. They had us. lots of spies. Klaus Fuchs had penetrated the inner circle of scientists. They said yeah. there was somewhere in the neighborhood of over 250 they called them atomic spies. Yeah, isn't and, that crazy? And what they would do, they would get into uh, Britain, and they would come over as British scientists and workers and relay all this information back to uh, Mother Russia. Mother about Russia. About what we were doing. So, moving on. We good? Yeah, can we do? Uh, can I do like the specific dis- description of what it is from memory? From memory, yes. From let's, memory. Let's hear it. And this isn't this isn't Wikipedia. No, for sure. I know you never look. The at Manhattan that. Project was a was a research and development undertaking during World War II that produced the first nuclear weapon. It was oh. led by the United States with the support of the United Kingdom and Canada, like you had just mentioned. And this went from 1942 to 1946. The project was under the direction of Major General Leslie Groves. Of of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Check out our Army Corps of Engineers episode. Nice. I did not know it was Army Corps of Engineers. I just thought this was just like a bunch of scientists getting together. Uh, and nuclear physicist Robert Oppenheimer was the director of the Los Almos Laboratory, which designed the actual bomb. There's a whole bunch of facilities all over the U.S., but at the end where they actually made the bombs, like a lot of the enrichment happened in other places, but the actual nut and bolt turning, making the bombs, happened in Los Alamos. Well done. You know, Oppenheimer's a pretty cool name, and I never knew that was what he did, but I always knew the name Oppenheimer because it's funny sounding. It is. It sounds like he should be like directing an orchestra or something. Ooh. Not making bombs. Maybe he did that in his, you know, off time. Maybe. All right. Uh, the inspiration for the Manhattan Project was from emigrants from Nazi Germany. So thank you, Germany. We appreciate it. Uh, they knew that the Nazis were pursuing nuclear weaponry, and it turns out that's a scary thing. So this was brought to light by folks like our friend, close close personal friend, Albert Einstein. Good old Albert Einstein. As well as Enrico Fermi. So I think he was Italian. So yeah, a German he was. and an Italian. He was. He was. He was leaving. Uh, what Stalin? I think was was doing his bad stuff at the time. Hmm. Whenever uh, Hitler was doing his Stalin? bad stuff. Mussolini. Ah, it was. It was one of those bad Italian people. <laughs> Stalin. Jeez. Uh, you're really. You're really hitting hitting a lot of home runs. My history is not the best. <laughs> All right. So they went and either met with the president or wrote him letters. They sent a letter yeah. signed by Albert Einstein saying, "Hey, yo, you should probably start looking into this stuff." And Roosevelt was like, eh, eh, that's should because, we? That's because Germany at, at the time was was pretty far ahead. They were doing all kinds of research into heavy water, which I don't understand any of the science behind any right. of this stuff for the oh, most part. Oh, these people part. have to be so smart. Like the uranium stuff, be? I kind of get. But heavy, what do you mean heavy water? Like it's... It, Water weighs eight pounds a gallon or whatever it is. How, how could you have heavy well, water? Well, then you put that water softener in it, and that makes it better. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, so apparently they were pretty far ahead of us, and, and yeah. all of these scientists, in particular Jewish scientists that were being you know basically 
Um, you know, I mean, you know what happened. We know right. ha- we know what we know how uh, Hitler felt about the Jewish people. Um, so basically, they had to leave to to flee uh, Germany and you know Poland and all the other places they were, and they came to the U.S. and Good thing they did, or else someone else may have had a nuclear bomb before we did. That's true. They said that the the Nazi government basically held back the development of, or, or the speed of development in Germany because of the restrictions and things like that. So that was helpful. Uh, did you actually know that even though it's called the Manhattan Project, yes, it wasn't all done in Manhattan, like you said. It's in Los Alamos was where it was all pieced together. But Manhattan does play a role in this, and we'll get into that here in a little bit. What do you think? Sounds good. Okay, so do you care if I kind of pound through some of this history? I would love you to pound through the history. I thought you would. All Can't right. Wait. Roosevelt set up an advisory committee on uranium. Teddy. So, Teddy. <laughs> thank you. Good. So after. Um, after Rose or after uh, Einstein and friends wrote in and said, "Hey, you should look into this," he slowly started setting this stuff up, right? And so a bunch of scientists and military officials were supposed to research uranium and how it could be used as a weapon. And the U.S. government started funding this research with all what's his name, Fermi, the guy that we just talked mm-hmm. about, as well as I don't even know how to say this guy's name, Leo Sillard. Yeah, you nailed it. Okay, at Columbia University. Yep. And this was the focused on radioactive isotope separation, known as uranium enrichment and the nuclear chain reactions. So basically the fundamentals of what's needed for these bombs. Yes. Right? So the Advisory Committee on Uranium na- changed its name to the National Defense Research Committee before finally being renamed the Office of Scientific Research and Development. I feel like this is just one big marketing ploy, yeah, right? It's they, all about brand building. They were really good at like coming up with these crazy names that made it sound like what they were like doing it's okay. wasn't creating death machines. <laughs> right, seriously, that's like, well, we're just going to kind of mask what's going on yeah. here. So then, like you said, the Army Corps of Engineers, Corps... The Army Corps of of Engineering, or of Engineers, joined the OSRD in 42, uh, and the project officially morphed into a military initiative. So instead of just research and things like that, now it became go build bombs to end this war. Do you know why they gave it to the Army instead of the Navy? Please do tell me. Because they were considering giving it to the Navy, um, because obviously the Navy has, you know, capabilities to do those sorts of things too Uh, at the time. Of course. But uh, they didn't have large-scale construction experience, and they knew as a part of the development of these bombs, they were going to need enrichment facilities. They were going to need, you know, all kinds of, you know, housing and just a crazy amount of construction. Like these, these scientists, they lived at these facilities just because of security reasons. So... That's really interesting. Yeah, so they gave it to the Army Corps of Engineers because they had the experience with large-scale construction projects. And, um, yeah, so that's why they got it instead. And if you listen to our Army Corps episode, we get into, like, how they basically won all of the wars for us ever. So that's pretty interesting. I didn't even piece together that part of why it was handed over to them for this episode. And and also, I I read a statistic somewhere in the neighborhood of seven—so, like, all of the cost— for the Manhattan Project to make all these of them. to make these four bombs to do all the facilities oh, yeah. paying all the engineers all that sort of stuff something in the neighborhood of seventy percent of it was purely construction projects because if you think of the housing the facilities all that sort of stuff very little of it was actually the mining and the material itself that made the bombs up nothing like a little bit of war for the economy huh yep. So the OSRD formed the Manhattan Engineer District in 1942 and was based in New York City's borough by that name. And U.S. Colonel Groves, who you mentioned, was appointed to lead the project. So that's how the Manhattan Project got kind of tied into Manhattan because of the original happenings there. Fun fact. Ooh, how fun. Grover from Sesame Street was named after him. Nuh-uh. Yeah, I'm kidding. You, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. That's amazing. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you would have had me, too. Hook, line, and sinker. Yeah, seriously. So the two scientists we talked about, Fermi and friends, were still engaged in research on nuclear chain reactions, uh, so separating 
the, the atom separations and how they interact, but now they moved to the University of Chicago and successfully enriched uranium to produce uranium-235. And then old scientist Glenn Seaborg, another good listener of the show, was producing microscopic samples of pure plutonium, and the Canadian government and military officials were working on nuclear research at several sites in O Canada as well. And so the the uh, quantity production of plutonium-239 required the construction of uh, just giant-sized reactors, right? And power that would, re- would release 25,000 kilowatt hours of heat for each gram of plutonium being produced. So the amount of resources were, was just immense to make this stuff. Fun fact about plutonium that I didn't know. Ooh. I just assumed you could just mine plutonium. It was like, oh, let's go get our axe and picks oh, out and mine sure. plutonium. It, 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 plutonium does not occur naturally in, in nature. It's, so I can't pick up a plutonium rock. You can't go pick up a plutonium. You can pick up a whole bunch of uranium. Your hand would probably fall off from the radiation and whatnot. Oh, true. Uh, but it's actually produced from the enrichment process of uh, uranium-238, I believe. So... The uranium that's easy to work with is uranium-235, but the problem is of all the uranium in the world, only 1% of it is uh, 235. So they typically have to work with the other uraniums and do all kinds of chemical modification processes to pull out the different... I forget what the numbers mean. I'm not... Yeah. It It was radium that that the women of America bought for... Yes. Uh, for Marie Curie, yeah, right? Was. Check it out was. that episode. It but was. yeah, okay. So before we move on to talk a little bit more about uh, how this stuff was all made, let's take a break for a word from our sponsor. I have to assume that it is. I, I got nothing. I got nothing too for this one. I normally have something funny that nothing. is relevant. We but... do have some shout outs. Okay, we good. actually had like an all star lineup of write ins this Ooh. week. All longtime listeners, longtime writers. Steve F wrote in, JP wrote in again, Jeff S wrote in, and Charlie W all wrote in. Um, some were saying, hey, thanks for stickers. One gave you, you know, great job on your rant, JP. He's just what? loving himself some Luke lately, and yeah. I don't like it. And then Jeff S. and uh, Steve F. both had something to say about our electrical engineering episode. I guess it was negative. <laughs> they they like us, so it was okay, but I don't think they're big fans of us sassing on the electrical engineers. Apparently, we went pretty hard at them. If they were better people one, and yeah. became mechanicals. One mentioned that he is an electrical and he actually works for a civil engineering firm. Oh. I didn't have the heart to be like, ooh, that might be worse. But you and I are, I mean, we're mechanical guys, and <laughs> we're both in marketing. I mean, I can barely, other, other than the degree, I can't say anything about yeah. that. Anyways, if you want to write in and get a shout-out like we just gave, why don't you email us at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com. And don't forget to subscribe. Don't ooh. forget to like. Don't yeah. forget to comment. How share, about a review? A review. Uh. Share with your friends and family. I mean, I really think it's it's really our listeners' job to help make America a better place by sharing. Sharing is caring. Sharing is caring what we do with the world. We are making the world a better place. The more you know. I forget the music, but yeah. All right, let's move back on to uh, how this stuff went down. How about it? Cool. So the whole production process, right? An intermediate step in putting this method into production, so of creating this hazardous material that will be used for bombs, was the... was uh, the product the construction of medium-sized reactors at Oak Ridge? So the large-scale production reactors were built on an isolated. This is crazy, just like for safety reasons, an isolated thousand square mile chunk of land on the Columbia River, uh, inside of Washington, and this was called the Hanford Engineer Works. Can you imagine just having these giant facilities that are just plopped in the middle of nowhere? Well, some of them weren't. Like Oak Grove, which is in Tennessee, Mm -hmm. wasn't necessarily in the middle of nowhere. But there was actually all kinds of crazy political stuff happening because they they basically took the property. Oak Ridge. I'm sorry. I said Oak Grove. Oak Ridge. uh, They took the property, and people, like, lived and owned the property. And it was like there was a big legal battle to get the property. And we're like, eh, it's the the government. The government was just like, eh, "Eh, it's ours. Yeah, we need to make bombs to kill people, so you're out. Really? I didn't didn't realize that. I thought most of this was already existing property that the government owned, like Area 51, where all the aliens are and stuff like that. But no, they, uh, they, 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 they... 
use some eminent domain or whatever that's called and took property. Eminent domain. I think that is what it's called. Well done. So in 42, Roosevelt authorized the formation of the Manhattan Project to combine all the various efforts that were going on around the country and Britain and Canada and bringing everybody into the loop, right? And so more than 30 laboratories and sites and more than 130,000 people were eventually involved in the different facets of like different like nuclear research and the construction like you were talking about as well as the assembly and mm -hmm. all of the testing just a massive amount of people but there were the three main places like we mentioned uh oak ridge in tennessee the place up in washington and then los alamos in new mexico Whew. that's a lot that is a lot can so, i can i back up just a little bit i mean i guess so so we didn't say where like this and, and i should have said this before but like where this all started from so all of this work, 130,000 people. So I I thought that we kind of invented this. Like I thought this what was do you like mean, we, like the U.S. and Canada and you know uh, the the U.K. But it really came from the discovery of nuclear fission was oh. by a German scientist by the oh, name yeah. of Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann. Uh, back well in 1938. So it was purely theoretical at the time. They didn't actually do anything. And then um, Leslie Metner and Otto Frisch, Fritsch, uh, they developed uh, an atomic bomb a as a theoretical possibility, uh, just knowing like the energy that could be produced. So the fact that, I mean, this went, you talk about the speed at which we were moving at the time. I mean, they threw, you said, what, over 130,000 people at this? So in 1938, this was purely theoretical. I think I think the neutron, which makes this possible, was just discovered a few years earlier. And between 1938 and then whenever they actually dropped the bomb, you know, back in like 1945, they, they had the one detonation in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. So in literally less than 10 years, they went from theory to facilities to enrichment to manufacturing to testing a bomb which is bananas to me see that makes me think how how come you haven't cured cancer yet i know or something like you dumped all this all these resources into this i get it you, it, you know had to be done all that it's great that that you know everything worked out for america but just imagine if you could put that kind of focus on something else like this or maybe it's just that much harder of a problem to solve what do i know and, well, and these cats are doing this with that modern technology. Yeah. Could you imagine if they had like, you know. They didn't like have us educating the world. Exactly. I mean, imagine if they had supercomputers and all the computing right? power that we have Probably now. could have done this in a weekend. Easily. Yeah. Okay, a few more things before we take our next break. What do you say? Shoot. So this is when, around the time when Oppenheimer took over. And uh, he was already working on the concept of nuclear fission. And that's when he became the director of Los Alamos, known as Project Y. And this is where the first bombs were built and tested. So fun fact about all this, the residents of Los Alamos, which was Project Y, lived really, really restricted lives. Yeah. Like, everything was censored. Their mail was censored. Their phone calls were monitored. And even, like, when they were talking with family members, that was all kind of spied on and tightly controlled how much they could communicate with them and how often. All the mail and official documents listed on the site's location only were at P.O. Box 1663 Santa Fe, New Mexico. So, like, everything coming in and out was completely, like, tied down. That's interesting. Yeah. I think it creepy. had to be. Very big yeah, brother. It had to be, I think, considering all the, the spies and stuff like we had talked about. So. That's true. So, on July 16th, 1945, in, like, a gross part of the desert, Al Alamogordo, I think I got it, you Alamogordo, it. New it. Mexico, the first atomic bomb nicknamed... The gadget. The gadget was successfully de detonated. Detonated. The Trinity test is what it was called, creating a giant mushroom cloud. The picture that I think everybody associates with, like when you think of nuclear, the nuclear testing, that's that's the picture is from the New Mexico is I think what most people think of when they see that the big mushroom and it's red and all it's that like kind of stuff. Like whenever you see bombs by Wiley e. Coyote, that's kind of what they exactly. look like, right? Yeah. So. Uh, I want to get a little bit into this Trinity test, but before we do that, let's take a break for Luke's rant. Yeah, so here's my rant. So normally, as, as, as most of our longtime listeners know, I do crack research every single podcast. I spend minutes and minutes 
researching these podcasts. Accurate. Accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Any chance I get to watch a movie oh, no. that demonstrates what the topic is, so I was super excited. The Manhattan Project, right? Must be a movie. Must be a movie. John Lithgow, 1986, right? Sounds I, good. I get about 20 minutes into this movie, and I realize <laughs> this movie is not set in 1945. Um, this movie's set in the 80s. What was it about? So it was about so John actual Manhattan. Yeah, so I, it was John Lithgow was working at like a nuclear testing facility, and his his you know kind of tough, rambunctious stepson, son of the girl he was dating, like steals his key cards and breaks in and causes a national emergency with like he stole some plutonium or something like that. So it took you 20 minutes to realize it was oh, based yeah. in the 80s. <laughs> I thought maybe it was like a modern interpretation of it, and then I realized. It was not even like a, a modern, modern interpretation. interpretation. <laughs> so, for full disclosure, the movie The Manhattan Project is not about the true Manhattan Project like we are talking now. And I was unable to find a movie to support me. <laughs> Very so, good. That's my rant. Sorry. All right. So, a little bit more about the Trinity test. Scientists denote detonated geez, a plutonium bomb at the test site located on the U.S. Air Force Base something like 120 miles south of uh, Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. So Oppenheimer chose the name Trinity for the, for the test site, inspired by poetry by John Don. Don? D-O-N-N-E. -N -N -E. How would you say it? Don. Don. Okay. Do you want to hear it? Yeah. So it's poem, holy sonnet 14. And I guess some people call it batter my heart. Oh. Batter my heart, three-personed God for you. As yet but knocked breath shine and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand, o'erth me and bend. You forced a break, blow, burn, and make me new. Blah, 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 blah. Apparently this inspired the man. Really? So we're getting kind of deep here, edumacating our listeners with this great poetry. I don't really know poetry. I don't I like don't it. I don't understand it. But anyways, he did, because he's smarter than me. So this bomb had power equivalent to around 21,000 tons of TNT, and the bomb completely blew up this steel tower that it was attached to or detonating on. Uh, it created a half-mile-wide crater and turned the sand below it into glass, which is kind of cool. And then they made a bogus cover-up story that was released that a huge like ammunition dump had exploded in the desert and that's why this giant explosion happened that everyone was like huh wonder what that was they said something like 10 miles away you could feel the heat yeah. from this so how could everyone watching it not just be like all the cancer yeah right maybe and they were i think a lot of them probably did so f f not fun fact but interesting fact so nuclear fission so you, you talked about like the magnitude so if you took equivalent amounts of TNT and nuclear fission fuel, it's two million times more energy. Wow. So like one kilogram of TNT, one kilogram of nuclear fuel, you make them blow up 20 million times stronger. We've had a lot of episodes that kind of compare stuff to TNT. Yeah. And it just seems real weak now. It huh? does. It does. Like, psh, I could probably hold like some of that. Like, Wiley Coyote's messing around with TNT. Why, yeah. didn't, he, why didn't he just like, drop a vision. nuclear bomb on that stupid bird? Oh, man, that bird's the worst. Continuing with that number there, so whenever that bomb goes off, mm -hmm. right, about 50% of the energy is actually considered blast energy, right? Okay. 35% uh, of that is heat, so it gets, like you said, turns the sand to glass, uh, super hot. And then 15% of it... That's the technical term, is super hot. Super hot. 15% uh, is the actual nuclear radiation, and this is like the bad stuff. That's, I was going to say, if you could up that number, boy, yeah. you could really jack so, some so stuff So this up. is this is where the nuclear fallout happens and all the crazy, like, if, if you didn't die in the blast and you didn't die from the heat... You're probably gonna die from radiation yeah, poisoning you still have limited and the time. side effects. So, and I mean, I don't have any numbers on it, but aren't what or wasn't the land where the bombs were dropped just kind of like destroyed? Yeah, not forever, but basically yeah, forever. Yeah, it takes a really long time to remediate that yeah, land. So that's terrible. Uh, so scientists under Oppenheimer had developed two different types of bombs, which I didn't realize: uh, a uranium-based design called the Little Boy and a plutonium-based weapon called the Fat Man. Mm -hmm. So I love that name. That's pretty sweet. You want to know where they were dropped? 
I I mean, I do. Yeah. So unfortunately, it ended the war, but you know, people die, so it's always unfortunate people die. So a uh, little boy was dropped on Hiroshima. Crazy. You talk about like how quickly they moved. The test was in July 16th, 1949, the one you talked about in mm-hmm. New Mexico. A month later is whenever they dropped uh, Little Boy on Hiroshima, and they dropped Fat Man on Nagasaki. Fat Man. Yeah. And it wasasn't supposed to be Nagasaki. There were some weather patterns oh, that is were that preventing right? it. Yeah. Oh, I didn't I, know that. Where it was supposed to be another city, but they diverted because of weather problems, and they couldn't turn back, so they chose Nagasaki. And crazy between and this is just like the initial death toll this isn't like all the fallout the radiation fallout, right. stuff 185,000 people were killed combined between the two of them and i have a little like sad face for that because that just seems like a lot of people to die a lot of innocent people you know i get it's war and crazy stuff happens in war but uh a lot of not fun facts about that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, so it was kind of just bad timing for japan that this all happened to them because on like July 26th and 45, there was the Potsdam, Potsdam, sorry about that, Potsdam Conference uh, for, in Allied Occupied City of Potsdam in Germany. And this is where the U.S. basically said, hey, Japan, you know what you should probably do is surrender because, you know, yeah. Germany's pretty much done over here. We got this under control. You need to stop doing this. And yeah. Japan was like, yeah, we're not going to do that. Yeah. And so that's when the first uh, bomb was dropped. And even after that, they were like, yeah, still not going to surrender. The second one, they were like, okay, we're good here. And, and the fourth uh, one was never used. So they, they, they and oh, all, yeah, all, right. all of this effort went into making four bombs. Right? They, the, the one they tested, Nagasaki, Hiroshima, and the fourth one was, uh, was never used. Did you know that the reason they wouldn't accept these terms is because under basically like the, the rules of what the allies were trying to enforce there wasn't a role for the emperor in japan for the future and therefore the ruler wouldn't uh, accept the terms basically wow. like self-preservation of his I'm way not of life have a job you yeah. mean <laughs> yeah basically really? it's like early retirement yeah uh so far following the end of the war the united states formed the atomic energy commission to oversee a bunch of research and design to apply this newfound technology that they just spent all this money on mm-hmm. uh into other fields so at least that's good and and i think the things we have to th- i mean you know thanks to manhattan project we have uh, atomic power plants so we have yeah. nuclear power powering hundreds of thousands of homes all over the globe uh nuclear medicine has roots in all of this research stem cell research which i never knew has its roots I didn't in know the that manhattan either. project and uh, that sort of stuff and then obviously nuclear chemistry and nuclear physics fields uh, that are typically related to health uh, things. So, If you're really interested in the details of that, as we kind of glossed over a bit of it, check out our fission versus fusion episode, as well as our stem cells episode. Stem cells, everyone hates that episode. It yeah. gets no listens. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 it's a controversial jerks. topic in some it is. cases. Well, that's why I thought maybe it would get some more listens. So fun fact about the cost of this stuff. Did you see this number? Uh, <laughs> the final tally for everything was nearly two billion dollars so this was for the research and the development of the bomb building all of the facilities they stuff made four like that. of them the bombs half a billion each yeah Whew. isn't that crazy and so the original amount that was uh okayed for this project six thousand dollars so they were just just slightly over budget. And, you know, governments are never, they governments never go over budget. No, so never. I'm sure this is unusual. Yeah. In today's dollars, that would be something like $23 billion. So quite an investment in a very short period of time for this. So something I learned okay, with this that, that uh, I, I thought our, our listeners would be interested in, like I kind of knew they talk about splitting the atom. Like you mm-hmm. hear that, mm-hmm. and that's how the energy is produced. But the way it's actually done... So they take an unstable radioactive isotope uh, of uranium or plutonium, and they take a single neutron, and they smash it into um, the atom. And then what happens is that, and, and, and that's like a little one. That's like a little kind of like thing, right? Pew. Yeah, it's like that. And then what happens is all the other atoms around, they're like, oh, no. Pew, 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 and then pew, next pew, thing pew, you know, and all of this happens, and this is a term I've never heard before, a picosecond. Oh, that so, sounds that sounds either very long or very short. So it is a point 
11 zeros and a one wow. of a second. So For that, this whole reaction so, to happen. So that initial single neutron that comes in and starts the reaction. So that all happens in a picosecond. That's crazy. That's, cr- yeah, that's just that's, crazy. Yeah. Uh, and to think that people can understand this stuff. And that's where Pikachu got his name and power. <laughs> I, I have no idea. Two fun stories for you. Fun fact? Shoot. Uh, investigators were or had conducted more than 1,500 loose talk, that's a quote, loose talk or leakage of information cases, and corrective actions were taken in more than 1,200 violations of people handling this classified material or talking about it too much. Yeah. That's a lot of loose lips. That is a lot of loose lips. But again, it sink ships. That's right, or cost you bombs or something. Next, it wasn't just like spies and stuff that was making this happen. So there was an article printed in the Cleveland Press. Uh, Leave it to Cleveland. Right? They're the the worst. The Forbidden City was what it was called, I think. And then it was called Uncle Sam's Mystery Town directed by by Second Einstein, quote unquote. So Jack Rapper was a columnist. He had just went on vacation in new mexico and he was stumbling on this giant city out there yeah that was kind of like yeah you shouldn't be going here and basically figured out that there's this research facility that's really highly contained and you're not supposed to be going in and so when he went home he wrote this article about about this i guess he got in a lot of trouble probably was not a big fan of the government at that time yeah the government wasn't a big fan of him so you know pretty interesting stuff going on yeah, so I, I so he, he, here here's my net of the whole episode. Ooh, I like it. Ready? I feel like it ended the war. It ended. I, so I feel that way as well. It, it it clearly and definitively ended World War II, which you know needed to be ended. Uh, it, it was it was a shame the way it ended. You know, with all the loss of life, uh, it triggered the Cold War. So that was fifty years of being afraid of Russia and the U.S. all over the world, kind of pointing missiles at each other for the for the next fifty years. But if you look at like what we mentioned, all the good things, nuclear medicine and, you know, all the different, you know, cancer research. It was worth it, you're saying. I, I, I don't know. It, it's really tough because would they, if they didn't drop those bombs and they didn't develop the bomb, would we still have developed nuclear medicine anyways? I mean, it's a tough question or at to the answer. speed that it happened. Exactly, exactly. Right. So uh, I, 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 I feel like it's, I feel like it's a, there's no net value because, Thousands and thousands and thousands of people died. Not all balanced out. And saying. I think they could have still done nuclear medicine. I, I don't know. It's, I don't know. It was interesting research. I enjoyed it. I did too. Hopefully everyone else enjoyed listening to us explain what the Manhattan Project was all about and learn something. So don't un- watch the movie. Don't watch the, yeah, the don't watch key the, takeaway. Yeah. Don't watch the movie. <laughs> well, until next time. See it.